So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, how you go about managing the security of an organization. And obviously attacks happen, but there's um, it's inevitable, basically. You're going, your, your system, if you're connected to the internet, is more, than, more likely than not to be attacked at some stage. Um, Adobe, um, eBay, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Google, pretty much every large company that I can think of off the top of my head has had some kind of security compromise or vulnerability discovered um, in the last couple of years. So if, I mean, what that says is essentially you can't rely on just defending your systems. You need to have some plans in case something does go wrong. Um, so, you know, the, there are just constantly attacks happening. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. How do we actually manage the, the security of an, of an organization? So obviously, if we're talking about job prospects, um, the actual position of managing <coughs> security is something that's just in continually increasing in demand. Um, quite often, a large budget, um, large proportion of an IT budget will be towards managing security risk. And um, if you are working in security or in, in um, anything to do with information security, it helps to understand how management are making decisions just so that you can influence them. So if you're working within an organization in anything to do, well, to do with anything basically, if you know how to actually speak in the same language that management used to discuss their problems and to make decisions, then that makes it makes you more likely to actually have an impact within that organization and to be um, speak in a way that makes them take notice and actually um, communicate efficiently. So if you're actually managing security, you obviously you need to understand what's at stake, like what are the risks, what possible costs can there be, and what you can actually do to mitigate the risks. So what technical controls, what administrative controls, um, you know, what physical controls, what can we actually use to defend our security? Um, and you know, you need to actually maintain security through all the different business processes and you need to be able to talk to people within the organization including the technical staff but also people in management and just um, just everyone everyone every user within this within the organization you're going to need to have some level of communication with um, because the sorts of things that were that you're looking at aiming to do is protect the, an organization's um, assets so what you don't want is disruption of services, and business operations. So if you are a company like Amazon, you sell stuff online, your primary concern is making sure you can continue to sell stuff online because if your website goes down for an hour, just imagine how much money Amazon loses. Um, a lot. So that you know, it's really important that your services aren't disrupted. But also, you don't want you know disclosure of sensitive information, and as with all security, you've got confidentiality, integrity, and availability concerns. So, what things do we want other people not to know? What things do we want to make sure other people can't change? And you know, we want to make sure that we continue to be available so that we can keep making money. Um, but there's no perfect solution for everyone. So every organization is going to have different security needs and different security requirements. And because you've, and what happens a lot is someone will work somewhere and they get an idea of how they make decisions and what, how, you know, how they do security. And then you go somewhere else and go, oh, what we need is this, 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 and this. Well, actually, no, it's not that simple. Yes, you've got something to contribute to the discussion, but does that security stuff make sense for this organization? Does that fulfill this organization's needs? So you need to look at what the strategic needs of the specific organization is. Um, and remember that security is actually a supporting mechanism for the underlying business needs, right? So that if Amazon's business is to sell stuff, well, one of their, their like primary business, the retail side of it, is for them to sell stuff. So if the security solution is, well, let's make sure that no one can log in and view anything on Amazon without a user account. 
well, maybe that makes some sense of something to do with security, but that's not going to make sense for their business. They want people to be able to see what they've got to sell and what, they're, what they offer. <coughs> so you need to actually consider what are the goals of an organization and look at cost-benefit analysis. So if there's some security mechanism that would do wonders, but it costs more than what the organization <coughs> makes, obviously it doesn't make sense to, to pay for that. So you need to look at what are the resources, does it actually make sense to do what you're thinking of doing within that organization? So, um, the, the, in terms of scope, you've got um, technical controls that can help to mitigate certain risks. Um, but the, actually, the software or the hardware that you install is not a be-all and end-all solution. So, it, it's a part of the solution and it is incredibly important and you can't ignore it. In fact, if you are a technically minded person, it's going to be the majority of what you're doing in your job. But you need to also consider people and policy because if people aren't actually using the, the technology you put in place, so for example, you might go, oh, this is a fantastic idea. We'll stop people from being able to access any files unless they have the correct role and we'll make sure that you can't send information to another user within that organization without getting permission to do that. Um, and then what you'll find is people will just start sending all your classified documents via email because they can't figure out, I don't understand what your, how your security system works if you haven't made sure that they're well educated uh, with the security program and they understand how it all works and why they should be using it. They'll just find some way to subvert it and do it differently. So you need to make sure that the actual, the, the people and policy side of things is also taken care of. So, um, you know, you provide training to, to employees and um, you have physical security to actually lock the rooms that have the servers <coughs> and things like that. Um, and you actually make sure that all the rules actually suit the business's needs and not just something that you've found online in some template or something that you've worked well in your last organization. So, in 1943, a guy called Abraham Maslow proposed um, what's referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of needs and essentially is this diagram that if you study basically anything like education or um, anything to do with social sciences you'll come across this diagram at some point. Um, but basically it's, it's a psychological model that shows that once your basic needs have been met you start striving for more things and I guess the only reason I pointed out is that security is important. It's like one of the basic needs. Of, of anyone, you want to feel safe in your home, for example, and you, if you're an organization, you want to feel like your organization has some security and, you, you know, you're not going to get wiped out by, you know, a teenager in the bedroom, for example. So, security and safety are important for, for everyone. So, there's, there's obviously thinking about money because that's how organizations make a lot of their decisions. If, when there's a security breach, it can cost an organization either directly financially or indirectly. So, for example, um, indirect might be something like your reputation being damaged. So, when Sony um, had the PlayStation network was, was hacked, obviously that reflected very poorly on them. Um, and, you know, if you're a customer, you might reconsider the way that you use their services, for example. Um, I suppose nowadays with all the really large scale um, attacks that have been published, um, maybe people are starting to get used to the fact that everyone's being hacked, but still um, it's definitely not good for your reputation um, to know that the, an organization that you should be able to, that they want you to trust them, um, it, you lose trust in an organization after something like that happens. So just some random statistic from, um, from Symantec. Uh, is that in 2011, average organization apparently incurred uh, $470,000 uh, in losses from IT security attacks and whatever. You can find lots of people coming up with other random statistics and all sorts of, um, all the antivirus like companies, you know, have some interesting stats that they like to push to like make sure you don't. statistics are made up on the spot. Yeah. Can't try, you know, yeah. So, I mean, take it with a pinch of salt. This specific number, how reliable it is, I don't know. But the point is, it costs a lot of money. Um, and when you are trying to make um, 
and argument to management, it does help if you can find some statistics to back up or some, some actual figures to back up what your argument is. Um, so indirect costs. Um, there have been studies that have actually shown that when a uh, compromise has happened, stock prices have gone down and different types of incidences have affected it in different ways. So there's a real effect on the natural organization. Um, but obviously, you know, if you lose data, that's going to cost data. That's going to lo lo lose you money um, in, you know, or lo might lose you some business if you lose your customer records for example and you've got no way to get in in contact with your previous customers that's a pretty serious problem uh, so direct costs uh, can include things like staff time so if you have had a security incident and you've got a security team working to solve the problem that's a cost you've got people working on solving the problem so that's money that it's costing to react to that incident um, that, and this has an opportunity cost because those people that you're employing could be working on something else, but instead they're working on this problem. So maybe, you know, even if you are already paying these people to work within your, your organization, the fact that they're spending their time on looking into an incident, that's, that's costing you money because time is money. Um, also, over time, so especially you know, if you're responding to some big incident and you, people have to come in on the weekend or overnight or something to help deal with some problem, that's going to cost money. You might need to get some um, like outsource help maybe, get a security consultant in, cost money. Um, it might cost you extra bandwidth for quota. So for example, if you um, have had a breach and they start hosting files off your servers, that's going to cost you money. Um, Losing sales, as I said before, can, co can cost money. So there's all sorts of direct ways that an organization can lose money. So what do you think it would cost an organization to, for example, leak credit card details to, to an attacker? £10,000 fine per person. Yeah, so there's, a, so there's possible fine, fine that can be, that the organization might need to pay. Yeah. Might not, just, might not just be a fine as well, prison time. Prison time. Yeah, I mean, so in the UK, there's um, principle seven, which is that you need to have reasonable controls to protect your um, the data of, that you hold, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. So if if you really haven't been doing the right thing with your security, then yeah, you could be liable. There are situations where you might be doing everything you possibly can, and it can still happen. So, like a new, like a zero-day vulnerability or something like that. Um, yeah, what you know, your organization might become part of a botnet, um, or you might end up with a whole bunch of malware on your computers. I mean, what is that going to cost you? In what way does that? Yeah, it can be damage that's directly done by that malware. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So like of fixing things or just like entirely replacing systems, might you might not have any other choice. Um, and then there's all the other costs that I just mentioned, like actually you know paying someone to look into it and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, and downtime obviously costs money. Um, you know if you end up someone ends up having control of your payment server, then horrible, horrible things can happen. You know, or, or customers end up getting redirected somewhere else. So that you know, you might be losing money because they they end up spending their money somewhere else, or it might be um, that they you lose your reputation because you know you, your customers have basically been attacked by your website. So there are other kinds of attacks um, as well. So you can have actual physical attacks nowadays. It's like kind of getting some headlines. So for example, malware has been found in airplanes and cars, so in like in entertainment systems and things like that. Um, researchers have shown that they could apply the brakes on, on some cars remotely via a security problem. Researchers have remotely disabled pacemakers, so they've actually shown that it was capable. So a lot, because a lot of pacemakers have like a wireless interface where you can manage your pacemaker. 
and um, there was like very little security. So someone could actually just like, if they're within range of that wireless signal, they can actually just t instruct it to just stop. Um, so obviously that's like quite a serious, quite a serious problem. Uh, and I think um, one of the plot points in an episode of Homeland or something, because uh, we all know TV is reliable and everything to a security. Um, 128 bit encryption. Got it. Um, SCADA, so you know SCADA systems. So Stuxnet has um, was was obviously one recently, fairly recently, allegedly created by the U.S. Um, and designed to attack nuclear facilities. Um, so that attacks vulnerabilities in SCADA systems. And cyber war is that term that likes to get thrown around a lot at the moment. Um, so Stuxnet, the one that they, they claim the government released on purpose. Yeah. Attacked the Yeah. Claim for the American government released it on purpose. So. Um, yeah. So I guess one of the one of the underlying um, difficulties is that organizations often view IT departments, which includes security, as like a cost center. So it's something that we need to sink money into in order to maintain our business. Um, so it's, it's something that doesn't actually generate any money. It's just costing the business money. So if you invest in the security of your organization, you know, one way of viewing it is that you're not actually making any money by doing that. It's just sinking money into this thing. So it's just this, it's just a cost center. Um, so it's just costing costing us money, and our actual business is something else. So that makes it that little bit harder when you're trying to convince management to actually spend money on something, um, because you actually need to make a convincing business argument for the fact that you should be spending money on security. So one of those terms that's helpful is return on investment, um, and basically most business ventures you kind of have to demonstrate a positive return on investment to get approved. So a return on investment is savings divided by cost. So if you can say by um, by installing this software we're actually going to save this much money because otherwise we would be losing it um, and then divide that by the cost that it actually costs the cost of actually implementing that security and that gives you a return on investment. Um, so obviously it's quite difficult to, to actually calculate those things without um, kind of finding either coming up with some numbers <clears throat> in as reliable a way as possible. So you, you can um, you can kind of com compose these things, various things. So like, what's the likelihood that something's going to go wrong? What does it actually take to prepare for it? You know, how much is it going to cost, and all all that sort of stuff. So there are, there's a few readings there in the slides if you want to check out some more information about that. Might be helpful for your resource quest. Remember, any, any, you can't submit something someone else has submitted. Um, so um, security management systems, information security management systems, is basically a, um, it's a set of policies for information security management. And developing one involves defining what the scope of it is, creating the policies for the organization, coming up with your risk assessment and risk management plans, um, selecting security controls, and all those things are defined in um, ISO 27001, which I'll talk about in a second. So within uh, an organization, depending on the size of the organization, you could potentially have a lot of people working in security. So you've got risk management specialists, so people actually working on making those decisions. You've got incident response teams that are actually the people that do something when something goes wrong and investigate something. Um, you've got a potentially development team that looks at your software and how secure the software is. You might have security specialists doing things like network administration and administering systems. You might have tiger teams, so in other words, like pen testing, like ethical hackers, vulnerability analysis, people actually testing the security of the, of the network and, and of systems. You might have phys physical security teams, so like people walking around checking that things are secure, locking the doors at the end of the day, you know, look, walking around the business. So all of these people, I mean, that's potentially a large organization has quite a lot of people fulfilling different types of security roles. And potentially they're all career choices for you guys when you finish your degree, um, you know, depending on what your interests are. So these people 
um, need to interact with all sorts of other people within the organization that are outside of security. So you, they need to talk to the IT department, the development staff, legal and marketing, because things can get quite you know, interesting. Um, and you always want the, legal, the lawyers involved in everything. Um, so risk management um, is part of organizing um, and managing an organization's security. And it's used to actually identify and assess and prioritize all the different threats and risks that your organization will face. Um, and a, a risk is basically the probability that something will happen. And a threat is the, the thing that could happen that would be bad, basically. Um, so you, you're making these decisions based on how likely bad things will happen. So the goal of any risk management plan is to remove uh, risks and um, minimize consequences um, if you can't get rid of it entirely, get rid of the risk entirely. And risk assessments um, can be used to identify what risks um, are actually likely to happen to you, to your organization. And managing natural security involves balancing the costs and benefits of the defenses against the, um, the costs of, of a security breach. So generally speaking, the outcome of, of um, when you identify a risk is to do one of these things. You can either avoid the risk, so okay, we won't do that then. Let's just do something different so that we're not likely to, oh, we've got a website and it could get hacked. Okay, let's take the website offline. That's one possibility. Let's just like not get involved in that. We'll just be a physical store. Uh, you might accept the risk and say, well, we're happy that that could happen and we'll just deal with it. Or mitigate the risk so we'll actually do something proactive to stop it from happening. Oh, what security things can we put in place to fix that problem? Or transfer the risk, which would basically make it someone else's problem. Like we'll get insurance against that and you know we'll just pay that and then we don't have to worry if it goes wrong. Insurance company can deal with it. So those are the options. Um, we'll talk about risk management in a few weeks. So organizations need to continually protect their systems, detect something's happened, and react to things that have happened. And you need to protect your assets, but be prepared to react when something does happen, because you know you kind of have to assume that at some point the bad things are going to happen, and you need to plan for it. So security is this ongoing process of managing those systems. So we've got a number of different types of controls within an organization. We've got administrative controls, technical controls, and physical controls. So we've got like administrative policies and controls. So we've got, um, we'll look at organizational policies and guidelines. Um, we'll basically have procedural controls. So like what, what, how do we actually go, how does our business run? How do people make decisions? We we'll look at a hiring policy. Look at what we do when someone does something wrong. So we've got a policy, like a three strikes policy or something, to warn people that work for us. Um, we'll have a plan for managing incidents, and we will have a policy that describes what happens when something goes wrong and what the people that work here will do in that situation. Um, and all of these things are living documents. So you need to actually not just create a plan and then just yeah, we've got it, but actually make sure that well, people are actually doing things according to those plans, because otherwise it's meaningless. If you just have a bunch of documents you ignore, it's not going to be that helpful, except in a few situations, maybe. Um, so you actually need to make sure that they do stay up to date. And then you've got things like technical controls. So you've actually got the software and hardware. You actually have, like, you know, you, you know you've got a firewall. You've got, you've got an intrusion detection system. You're using access controls. So you, you're doing all the technical stuff that limits access to resources. And um, we use like authentication and encryption and everything like that. We have physical controls, which are the fact that we actually protect the assets that are physical. We protect access to certain things and places. Um, and you know we might actually have locked doors, swipe cards, biometrics, whatever it takes to protect the physical side of things um, in terms of the business's needs. And we need a plan for when things do go wrong, which is what we, what contingency planning is. We have an incident response plan. We have, um, which is how we're going to go about detecting and mitigating events. Um, we have a business continuity plan, which is kind of a larger thing, which is how do we actually continue to operate under adverse conditions? And the, we'll, I'll do a lecture on that in a few weeks' time. Uh, and disaster recovery planning. So what happens if like our building gets destroyed, for example? Do we have somewhere else to go? Do we just pack up and go home? 
Um, is there, a, you know, what do we do under those situations? But in order to make any of these decisions, we need to accurately be able to measure security. Uh, because if we don't accurately measure anything, then we're just making stuff up. And it happens, unfortunately. Like, it can be quite hard to measure security and how secure you are and how much money you lose from different events and things like that. But you have to try it as well, you know, as well as you can to actually make accurate calculations so that you can make um, informed decisions. So you can use quantitative measures, so actually hard facts and figures, uh, or you can use qualitative information. So, for example, the impact on PR and things that aren't actually measured in terms of numbers, but things that are bad. And there are ways that we can formally assess our, our systems. Um, and the problem with, the, with those approaches is that it's very expensive. Um, and as, an, as a consequence, most like open source software, free and open source software, they don't bother going through those kinds of formal methods of, of um, confirming the security position because it's just, it's just really hard and costs a lot of money. It doesn't actually guarantee anything. Um, because Windows XP, for example, was certified um, under creative um, under common criteria, certified um, EAL four plus, and then since then we all know Windows XP is not necessarily the most secure piece of software. So the meaning of it, you know, you kind of have to ask yourself how meaningful it is. But there are various kinds of ways that you can actually test your own security. And there are standards that exist that provide best practice guidelines, so we can look at things like um, information security standards published by um, ISO and IEC. Um, so there's a whole series of standards, the 27,000 series of standards that are all about security and um, the 27,001, 2005 guidelines give you information about how you actually can improve an organization's information security. And there are ways that you can actually um, be certified to actually adhere to these to that standard. Um, so you need to show that you actually um, maintain an information security management system. And in order to pass that um, that certification, you need to show you that you meet every single requirement. Um, there's some flexibility there, but it's it, the you know you do need to show you that you need to meet each of those requirements. Um, so depending on some factors of your organization, that might be um, interpreted in different ways. So another kind of compliance thing is PCI compliance, so payment card industry. Um, so like Visa and, and MasterCard, if you, tr if you accept credit cards, you're required by them to actually be PCI compliant. So you need to actually be certified to adhere to their rules. Um, and um, the, depending on the size of your organization, there are a different set of rules, but basically you get validated according to that. Um, so there are a number of other laws and regulations. So the U UK Data Protection Act says that you need to protect um, personal data privacy um, and you need to actually use appropriate measures to actually secure a system. But not all data in an organization is security sensitive and you need to actually classify the information so that you protect things within an organization appropriately. Um, so for example, you might have some confidential information or private information. And if you're in the military, they use a different grading scheme for um, like classification, so like top secret and secret. Um, but you know, some types of security controls will actually label each specific piece of information um, and others might be a little bit looser than that. Um, but employees should know how to manage different classifications of information. So um, I think that's pretty, there's only a couple other slides there, but I think that we're pretty much running out of time. So, um, but I've covered the most important things that I wanted to cover. Um, there is some rec recommended reading at the end of the slides there. So I'll up update, um, I'll upload the newest version of the slides. So um, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks.